Manchester, New Hampshire. How are we feeling tonight? Thank you all so much for coming out tonight. My name is Eric Jackman. I am your brave and fearless MC for the evening. I am the pride of Peterborough, New Hampshire. And if I could please ask you to rise and join me in welcoming Cassie Schwartz, the wife of a proud Marine who will lead us in the national anthem. So proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming, whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight or the we watched were so gallantly streaming and the rocket's red glare the bombs bursting in air gave proof through the that our flag was still there. Oh, say does that star-spangled banner yet wave? Thank you, Cassie, that was beautiful. Like his uncle, President John F. Kennedy, and father, Senator Robert F. Kennedy before him, Robert F. Kennedy Jr. understands that we need to go down a new direction in this country in regards to peace, trade, and economic strength. We must alter course and chart a new path where the rest of the world doesn't fear us, but wishes to emulate and engage with the United States in the spirit of mutual respect and peaceful cooperation. Yeah. Town halls, debates, open forums are all part of the bedrock of the political process. This place, St. Anselm College in the New Hampshire Institute of Politics has been at the forefront of this tradition. <laughs> Hosting presidents, candidates, dignitaries, thought leaders from around the world to help better inform and engage citizenry in foster spirited discourse. The historic and essential New Hampshire primary tradition is under attack and it's now more important than ever to make sure it stays number one. I'm so appreciative and grateful that Mr. Kennedy is committed to testing this process, and I'm honored to be on the board, to be on the board, on board with the campaign as one of his Granite State coordinators. With your help, 
will heal the divide, rebuild our nation at home, restore our standing on the world stage, and return a Kennedy to the White House. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I look forward to this journey with all of you, standing on this first piece of ground, a piece of ground mixed with some granite. And what we're gonna do is heal this country. So please join me in welcoming my fellow New Hampshire coordinator, Rhonda Rohrbacker. Thank you very much. Hello, my name is Rhonda Rohrbacher, and I'm proud to serve as the New Hampshire State Coordinator for Robert F. Kennedy Jr. for President. <laughs> for 16 years, Dennis Kucinich was one of the good guys in Congress. He was not afraid to stand up and speak out for what he saw as the truth, and for policies that benefit all of our people, not just the cronious. He never backed down when our civil liberties were threatened. He stood tall in opposition to the Patriot Act. And why do you suppose he did that? Because he read it. <clears throat> Dennis really was ahead of his time on many fronts. It's fitting now that he's the campaign manager for Robert F. Kennedy Jr., who I consider to be the strongest advocate of peace, liberty, and truth in government to run for president in my lifetime. And ladies and gentlemen, it is my honor to introduce to you the national campaign manager for Robert F. Kennedy Jr. for president, the Honorable Dennis Kucinich. Thank you, each and every one of you, for being here this evening. Thank you for the hundreds who are waiting in overflow rooms for your patience and your presence. Thank you to the people watching at home from across America and around the world. Today, June 20th, is one of the days of the year filled with the most light, the portal of summer, when we bask in the full illumination of the sun. Our politics needs such light. They're often mired in the darkness of division, the tangled web of deceit, the lethal gas of censorship. With our nation's leaders fumbling, whistling mindlessly through the graveyards of history as they put us on the th threshold of a catastrophic war. Throughout American history, in times of crisis, leaders have arisen who have assessed the danger ahead and were prepared to guide our ship of state to a safe harbor and our people to a new world. Robert F. Kennedy, Jr. is that man, the man of the hour, whose commitment to this country is part of an historic commitment that his family made many years ago. Where there is division, Robert F. Kennedy will bring unity. Where there is censorship, he will restore free speech. Where there is the darkness of untruth, he will bring the light of truth. Where there, where there is war, he'll bring a gentle hand to calm the world and to guide it towards peace. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, 
Please join me in welcoming Robert F. Kennedy Jr., the light who shines in the darkness of American politics and will lead us to a new day. Thank you very much. Kucinich for your friendship and for your guidance and for all the hard work you put into this campaign. And thank you to St. Anselm's College for being a, an oasis of free speech and a, and a, during a time that was really a desert of censorship and, and suppression of dissent. Um, and, uh, and thank you to all the people of New Hampshire for keeping democracy alive. And, uh, and particularly retail politics, which is what we need in this country. We need our politicians. Um, instead of taking billions of dollars from billionaires and, and uh, aerially bombing our country with advertisements, we need a place where people actually, politicians have to come and be vetted in barber shops and diners and gas stations and, and nail salons and ask real questions by real people and have to interact with Americans to understand what's happening on the ground level in this country today. And New Hampshire is the place where that happens. So we need to bring the primaries back here. <laughs> 60 years ago this month, my uncle John F. Kennedy made an historic uh, speech at American University in Washington, D.C. And that speech was called the Peace Speech. And I'll give you some of the context uh, for what was happening at that time. The previous autumn, he had been in, in the Oval Office with his science advisor, who I knew very well as a boy, and then uh, growing up as well, Jerome Wisner. And at that time, I'm 69 years old, and I remember at that time the, the, the regular photographs on the cover of the New York Times and the other papers of atmospheric testing in the Pacific Atoll. So we were seeing the mushroom clouds of the atom bombs, the hydrogen bombs, and nitrogen bombs that were going off regularly in that part of the world. And that day, my uncle was meeting with Jerome Wisner and asking him what, he asked him at that meeting, what happens to the radioactive fallout? And Wisner said it circulates all around the globe very, very quickly, and then it drops back into the earth on the rain, in the rain, and it, it gets into our, our fish, our animals, our ponds, our rivers, our streams, our drinking water. And it was raining at that time, and my uncle spent a long time staring out the window, and he said to Wisner, do you think it's in the rain that's falling right now? And Wisner told him it was. And Ted Sorensen, who was in the room at that time and who had been with my uncle some of the through some of the most difficult times in his life, mourning the death of his brother, uh, and, and was with him when he almost died during his back surgeries, said that all the years that he knew John Kennedy, there was no time that he saw more trouble than that day. And that launched a resolution where he decided he wanted to ban nuclear atmospheric uh, nuclear testing. He knew his State Department would oppose it, and he knew the Pentagon was going to oppose it, so he did the whole thing secretly with Castro. By that time, they had to set up the hotline so they could talk directly with each other, but he negotiated the entire treaty through a, th few, through a few trusted aides within the White House who were shut and diplomats who were shuttling back and forth under the nose of the State Department when he finally, when they, they negotiated very, very quickly, and when he announced it to the United States, his State Department and the Pentagon uh, were in revolt, open revolt. In fact, the Pentagon, his Pentagon brass were lobbying Congress to kill this treaty by their boss, the commander in chief. And I think something like 80% of Americans initially opposed the treaty. And he was determined to get it passed and this speech turned the country around. It was the beginning of a process that turned the whole country around. 
this speech and the whistle, whistle tour that, stopped, that followed it, where he went to places where he did not have political support. He went to the South, he went to the Western states, he went and, lectured, uh, and gave speeches at the Mormon Tabernacle in, in Salt Lake, people who had not supported his presidency. But he found tremendous support on the ground from all Americans for making this happen, because it, as it turns out, the intelligence apparatus and the military perhaps wanted the war, but the American people did not, and they wanted to end to it. And the, the, with the speech, he did something extraordinary, something that had never been done before. To me, it's his most important speech. It's one of the most important speeches in American history. And the thing that he did that was so unusual in that speech is he talked to the American people and asked them to put themselves in the shoes of the Russians. Everybody else was doing the opposite at that time. They were demonizing and vilifying the Russians. And he said, no, we have to put ourselves in their shoes, in the, in the shoes of our adversaries if we want to have peace. We need to do that. It has to be a regular discipline. And at that time, most Americans, the, the zeitgeist of that era, I was born nine years after the end of World War II, and the zeitgeist of our era, and the, the, the governing assumption was that America had won the war, and now we were going to, now we were going to rightfully dominate the peace. And he said something very, very different than America, to, to Americans that challenged that sort of patriotic assumption. And he said, no, it was actually the Russians who won the war. They weakened Hitler and made it possible for us to march into Berlin. And he talked about the suffering of the Russians during the war and to legitimize their security concerns, which nobody was doing. Any, any show of military strength by the Russians at that time was portrayed as aggression. And what he was saying to the Americans is, no, they have legitimate security concerns the same as we do. And we need to understand those things. And he, he reminded Americans of the suffering that the Russians had had endured during the war, the unimaginable suffering. One in seven Russians had been killed during World War II. He said that, imagine, he asked Americans to imagine that all of the, the land, all of the cities, all of the towns from the east coast to Chicago had been leveled to rubble, that the forests and fields had been burned. And he said, that's what happened to Russia during the war. That's what they sacrificed for us. And they have legitimate security concerns to make sure that never happens again. And that speech turned around the American people. And they ended up supporting that. And it was one of the fastest ratified treaties in American history. I'm speaking to you today because the world is once again at a very similar crossroads. As in my uncle's time, nuclear tensions are at an extreme and dangerous level. As in his time, we have a unique opportunity not only to diffuse those tensions, but to take a radically different path, a path towards peace. My uncle's commitment to peace bore fruit in the limited test ban treaty of August 1963. But his assassination that November turned the nation down another path. His successors have launched one war after another, along with the ceaseless expansion of our military. Some call it the forever war. Americans used to identify herself as a peaceful nation. In fact, our founding, the framers of our constitution said that America, believed that America, that democracy was inconsistent with an imperium abroad, that if we tried to make ourselves an imperial nation abroad, that we would turn into a surveillance state, a garrison state, a security state at home, and that we would also destroy our economy. We would drain it as, as happens with every empire. Every empire ends itself through the expansion of the military, over expansion of its military abroad. And the, the founders knew that. John Quincy Adams spoke for all of them when he said, America goes not abroad in search of monsters to destroy. Today, I want to recall that memory because this forever war, which has so drained our nation's vitality, now threatens to plunge the world into the unspeakable horror of nuclear Armageddon. 
and I speak, of course, of the situation in Ukraine. I abhor Russia's brutal and bloody invasion of that nation, but we must understand that our government has also contributed to its circumstances through repeated deliberate provocations of Russia going back to the 1990s. Democratic and Republican administrations have pushed NATO to Russian's borders, violating our own solemn promise from the early 90s when we pledged that if Russia made this terrible concession of moving 400,000 troops out of East Germany and allowing the unification of Germany under a NATO army, a, a hostile army, that we would commit that after that, we would not move NATO one inch to the east. And James Baker gave that assurance, as did the British uh, government officials and many, many others. And yet, today, we have surrounded Russia. We have moved it not one inch to the east, but a 1,000 miles and 14 nations. We have surrounded Russia with missiles and military bases, something that we would never tolerate if the Russians did that to us. And statements from our government officials and think tanks lay out the goals for the Ukraine war. Regime change in Russia, the overthrow of Vladimir Putin. This is what President Biden has said, is there our purpose in the Ukraine. The disabling and exhaustion of the Russian military and the dismembering of the Russian Federation. None of these objectives have anything to do with helping the Ukraine, which of course was the pretext for our involvement in the war. That's when our leaders told us that we were there for a humanitarian mission, but they've since acknowledged that there is a broader geopolitical agenda and that Ukraine is simply a pawn in a, in a proxy war between the United States and Russia. Like teenagers, playing World of Warcraft, these warmongers inside U.S. leadership draw up war games and scenarios and, and pretend that a nuclear war is winnable. That is a dangerous lie. It's an illusion that my uncle's defense secretary, Robert McNamara, called mass psychosis. These individuals do not appreciate what John F. Kennedy understood when he said that of nuclear war, Quote, all that we have built, all that we have worked for, would be destroyed in the first 24 hours. Even one nuclear explosion spreads radio radioactivity around the world. Can you imagine the consequence of a full nuclear exchange? President Kennedy did. That's why he said, quote, above all, while defending our own vital interests, nuclear powers must avert those confrontations which bring an adversary to a choice of either humiliating, humiliating retreat of a nuclear war or a nuclear war. To adopt that kind of course in the nuclear age would be evidence of the bankruptcy of our policy or a collective death wish for humanity. Let me say that again. Nuclear powers must avert those confrontations which bring an adversary to a choice of either humiliating retreat or a nuclear war. The same, the shameful fact is that for the last 20 years, the advocates of a militaristic foreign policy within the U.S. leadership have done exactly the opposite. Their belligerent strategy of maximum confrontation extends beyond Russia to China, where the same group within our government hopes to use Taiwan as a geopolitical pawn, the same way they used Iraq and Syria and now Ukraine to further a vain fantasy of world domination through violent confrontation. Let's leave off geopolitical, geopolitics for a moment and take the matter of war and peace a little deeper. President Kennedy understood that peace begins with our basic attitudes and beliefs. He spoke of the futility of passively waiting for the other side to become enlightened. We quote, we must examine our own attitudes, he said, as individuals and as a nation, for our attitude is as essential to theirs. End quote. He, we should, he said, begin by looking inward. Yes, back in 1963, a politician really said that. A political leader. 
A political leader voiced what would be considered today a spiritual maximum or a spiritual principle. Let's take up that call from 60 years ago and ask Americans, all of us, to re-examine our attitude. We have been immersed in a foreign policy discourse that is all about adversaries and threats and allies and enemies and domination. We have become addicted to comic book good versus evil narratives that erase complexity and blind us to the legitimate motives and the legitimate cultural and economic concerns and the legitimate security concerns of other peoples and other nations. We have internalized and institutionalized a reflex of violence as the response for any and all crises. Everything becomes a war. The war on drugs, the war on terror, the war on cancer, the war on climate change. This way of thinking predisposes us to wage endless wars abroad, wars and coups and bombs and drones and regime change operations and support for paramilitaries and juntas and dictators. None of this has made us safer and none of it has burnished our leadership or our moral authority. But more importantly, we must ask ourselves, is this really who we are? Is this what we want to be? Is that what Americans founders envisioned? Here's another spiritual principle, one that my uncles also referred to when he said, quote, we are both caught up in a vicious and dangerous cycle with suspicion on one side breeding suspicion on the other and new weapons begetting counter weapons. When we hold others in the belief that they are implacable enemies, they tend to mold themselves accordingly to our view of them. It's a self-fulfilling prophecy or prediction and launches all players into a cycle of suspicion that, that my uncle warned against. Inhabiting the role of an enemy, we empower hardliners in places like Russia, China, Cuba, and Iran. We invite them into the drama of conflict, the drama of provocation and counter-provocation of weapon and counter-weapon. Is it any wonder that as America has waged violence throughout the world, violence, has overtaken us in our own nation. It has not come as an invasion. It has come from within. Our bombs, our drones, our armies are incapable of stopping the gun violence on our streets and schools or domestic violence in our homes. I see the same link here as my father and Martin Luther King saw about the Vietnam War. They saw that war, they believed that we could not have warfare abroad without bringing that violence home to our streets, to our attitudes, to our communities. Foreign violence is inseparable from domestic violence. Both are aspects of a basic orientation and a basic set of priorities. Waging endless wars. Waging endless wars abroad, we have neglected the foundation of our own well-being. We have a decaying economic infrastructure. We have a demoralized people, a, a despairing people. We have toxins in our air and our soil and our water. We have deteriorating mental and physical health. These are the wages of war. What will be? What will be the wages of peace? It will be healing of all the symptoms of America's decline. None of these are beyond our capacity to heal. We can restore America to the awesome vitality of the original Kennedy era. My uncle said it well. He said that no problem of human destiny is beyond human beings. He warned us that, quote, too many of us think that peace is impossible. Too many of us think it is unreal. But that is the dangerous and defeatist belief. It leads to the conclusion that war is inevitable, that mankind is doomed, that we are gripped by forces that, are, that we cannot control. We need not accept that view. 
Our problems are man-made, and therefore they can be solved by man. So how do we actually do that? We started by replacing the vicious cycle of suspicion with a virtuous cycle of trust building. We reverse escalation. It takes courage to make the first move toward peace. Let's see what happens when we stop the provocation and the escalation and offer instead an olive branch. Each step we take invites those who, call our, who we call our adversaries to take a step further. Maybe Russia won't respond. Maybe they won't respond in kind or in any way. But at least we will know that we tried. And the whole world will know it too. That step comes from a changed attitude and from courage. Speaking in the midst of the Cold War, John Kennedy asked us, quote, not only to see the distorted and desperate view of the other side, not to see conflict as inevitable, accommodation as impossible, and communication is nothing more than exchange of threats. Let's take a moment and allow the, that to sink in. Today, America has broken off practically all diplomatic contact with Russia, so that communication has indeed become little more than an exchange of threats and insults. FDR met with Stalin. JFK met with Khrushchev. Nixon met with Brezhnev. Reagan met with Gorbachev. Can't Biden meet with Putin? Do we have, can't we? Or can't we at least, can't we at least begin a conversation? Do we now have such a distorted and desperate view of the other side that we won't even speak to them? To see conflict as inevitable has become the cornerstone of US foreign policy. Two or three decades ago, it was the clash of civilization between Islam and the West. Today, those legions of think tanks that are funded by the defense industry exhort us to prepare for the inevitable war with China. The war is inevitable only if we make it inevitable. The war in Ukraine could have been avoided, even as late now we now know, as spring of 2022, when US officials sent Boris Yeltsin to Kiev to scuttle peace talks between Ukraine and Russia, a peace agreement they had already signed. And not only that, Russia had already begun removing its troops from the Kiev area. We now know this. The war was, this war was not inevitable. It was the creation of a relentless mentality of war and domination. At the height of the Cold War, JFK was willing to see beyond the prevailing stereotypes of Russia and its leader, Khrushchev, as the epitome of evil. The two men at that time exchanged 26 highly personal and private emails among each other. We had a, 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 a Russia, a KGB and GRU spy who used to come to my home as a, when I was a little boy, and we knew he was a spy, and this was the time that the James Bond mill films were all coming out, and we considered it you know, very sort of romantic and, and dangerous to have a, a real spy, Russian spy in our house. But he was a very charming guy. He was kind of short and um, extremely strong, and he would, do, he would do rope climbing contests with my father and push up contests, and he could do uh, the Cossack dancing uh, which was really impressive to, to all of us, and he taught us to do it. And he was very, he had a great sense of humor, and he was filled with laughter, and my father and mother uh, enjoyed his company a lot. They met him originally at the Russian embassy at a party. Um, but the State Department was horrified that we were letting a KGB spy into our home. Um, but he, he, during this period, my uncle wanted to talk directly to Khrushchev. The CIA didn't know anything about what was happening in the Kremlin, and they always thought the worst. They always told him the worst was happening, and he, he knew enough about politics to know that it couldn't be that bad. And ultimately, Khrushchev sent him the first of these letters hidden in the New York Times through Bolshevik, 
And these letters, and ran the State Department, both my, my uncle and Khrushchev realized during this correspondence that they were both surrounded by an intelligence apparatus and by military brass who considered war both inevitable and desirable. And that if they were gonna maintain peace, they needed to talk to each other because they, they could not trust the people around them to give them strong, disciplined advice. And at that same time, my uncle and Khrushchev installed a hotline which had never existed before. So when I was a boy, there was a red phone in the, in, at Hyannisport and another one in the White House where we knew that if we picked up that phone, we were supposed to stay away from it, and we did, because that was the one thing they said, don't ever touch that phone. <laughs> uh, but we knew if we touched that, if we picked up that phone, Khrushchev was going to answer. <laughs> and the wires from that phone are still sticking out of the of wall of my brother's house, which was, at that time, was the Summer White House. But they knew they had to talk to each other if they were going to save the world. They said, you know, the, that first letter from Khrushchev, he said, we're all on an arc. And we, you know, we're, we, we can't build another one. The earth is an ark, and we need to, we need to preserve it. And, <laughs> and the question now is, are we willing to do anything like that today? Or are we going to remain stuck in a self-righteous story in which America is categorically good and our po opponents are irredeemably evil. If we remain stuck there, so will every other nation. It's not only America that's falling in, fallen into this simplistic good guy, bad guy thinking. That's the example we've set for everybody in the world. No wonder it's been replicated everywhere between Israel and Iran, between India and Pakistan, between Shia and Sunni, between Jew and Arab, between Hindu and Muslim, left and right between pro-life and pro-choice, between vax and anti-vax. This tribalistic, us versus them thinking is tearing us apart. And it's... <laughs> and it's tearing apart our country and it's tearing apart the world. So, this... These are the wages of war. But when we take the first step toward peace, we will become once again a true world leader, a moral leader, a moral authority. And our example, it doesn't take much, it's just the first step. And people will start looking at America differently the way they did when my uncle was president. My uncle, I, I pointed this out, in my announcement speech, my uncle was so determined, he told his be one of his best friends, Brent Bad ben Bradley, said to him, um, what do you want on your, as your epithet on your gravestone? And he said, he kept the peace. He said, the, and Bradley asked him to explain that, and he said, the primary job of an American president is to keep the country out of war. That's what he said, and during... <laughs> During his time in the White House, he was surrounded by military hogs and his intelligence apparatus, his military brass, who wanted it, who, who were constantly exhorting him to go to war in Laos, in Berlin, in Cuba, in Vietnam, and he'd never sent a single combat troop abroad during his term in office. He ultimately, they wanted him to send 250,000 combat troops to Vietnam. He ended up sending 16,000 advisors who were not under the rules of engagement, allowed to participate in combat. That's fewer people, fewer men. And he sent to get James Meredith, one black man, into Ole Miss, the University of Mississippi in Jackson. And a month before he died, in October of uh, 1963, he heard that a, uh, that a Green Beret had died in Vietnam, and he asked one of his aides to give him a total casualty list. And the aide came back, and the casualty list had 75 Americans on it who had died in Vietnam, and he said, that's too much. We're not gonna have a single more American die. That day, he signed National Security Order 263 that ordered every, true, every US uh, service person home from Vietnam. 
with the first thousand leaving the next month and uh, beginning in November. And, uh, and that, he died a month later. And a week after his death, that order was remanded. And President Johnson ended up spending, sending 250,000 troops by President Johnson. President Johnson ended up sending 250,000 troops. Ultimately, 560,000, 56,000 never came home, including my cousin, George Skakel, who died in the Tet Offensive. And we killed a million Vietnamese. And, um, and uh, you know, we had a, we, we've, we've then gone off on this path with a military industrial complex, which President Eisenhower had warned about a week before, or three days before my uncle took office in the best speech that he ever gave and one of the most important in, in history where he warned America that if we did not take great steps, pains to avoid it, the, mili the emerging military industrial complex would devour our democracy. It would destroy American values from within. And my uncle knew that, he knew that speech, and he spent the three years, his thousand days in office, fighting against the, the rise of the military industrial complex. After his death, we went down that path that Eisenhower predicted, and that's where we are today. And it's time now to reverse that. It's time. <laughs> Thank you. As I said before, peace comes from a changed attitude. At the bottom of the war mentality, at the bottom of the war mentality that casts the world into a drama of enemies and threats and lie, lies a debased view of human nature. When you see humans as fundamentally selfish and whole nations as fundamentally evil, then all you have available to change their behavior is threats and bribes. Peace comes from a different place. It starts by seeing within others and within ourselves that which is not selfish, but is brave and generous and idealistic and has good intentions. And I'm not saying that we should ignore the base elements of human nature or the dangers of the world. But if that's all that we see, and we're gonna be stuck forever in the mentality of war, and that's where the military industrial complex wants to keep us. And we will reap forever its poisonous fruits. To chart a course for the future of our nation's military and foreign policy, I'll return once again to the words of John F. Kennedy. He said, quote, America's weapons are not provocative. They are carefully controlled. They are designed to deter and capable of selective use. Our military forces are committed to peace and disciplined in self-restraint. Our diplomats are instructed to avoid unnecessary irritants and purely rhetorical hostility. End quote. The current administration is gonna be in power for another year and a half, but the danger of reckless escalation and nuclear brinksmanship is real and present. I therefore call on our present leadership to adopt President Kennedy's maxims and to start de-escalating right now. I call on them. I call on them to fulfill John F. Kennedy's declaration I call on the military establishment to exercise disciplined self-restraint. I call upon the State Department to avoid unnecessary irritants and hostile rhetoric. And here's the most important thing of all. I call on every American to join in a new peace movement, to make your voices heard, to reject the insanity of escalation, and to celebrate no longer the wartime president, but a president who keeps the peace. And to what kind of peace do I refer? I'll end with one more piece of wisdom from my uncle. Quote, what kind of peace do we seek? Not a Pax Americana enforced on the world by American weapons of war. 
not a piece of the grave or the security of a slave. I'm talking about a genuine peace, the kind of peace that makes life on earth worth living, the kind that enables people and nations to grow and to hope and to build a better life for their children. Not merely a peace for all men and women, but not merely a peace for our time, but a peace for all time. Thank you all very much. So the interest in this, the interest in this has been extraordinary, and this is an historic pivotal moment. And the bat, the the, re -elect, the the election of Robert F. Kennedy president starts right here in New Hampshire, and we need your help. Please visit Kennedy24.com to volunteer, and please remain seated for just a few moments for security reasons. Um, we're also going to be splitting into breakout sessions. Um, so take a look at your program if you'd like to participate um, in the program that you're interested in. And we will have ushers that can escort you to uh, the different rooms. And for all of you hosting watch parties at home, we encourage you to start your own breakout discussions. Um, the breakout discussions that we're going to be hosting here, the first one is um, Peace Consciousness in Foreign Policy by Charles Eisenstein, and that's gonna be held in the Dana Center right around the corner here in this building. And the second one is Strategies for Peace um, by Kristen Christman, and that's gonna be in the Dana Center conference room right down the hall here. And the third one's gonna be hosted by Dennis Kucinich, Building Peaceful Communities, and that's gonna be in the Student Center at the Malucci Theater right across the uh, parking lot. Thank you so much for coming to support this great man to be the next president of the United States.